Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, thank you, Yvonne, uh, for that w wonderful uh, introduction. And thanks so much to everyone at Courage uh, who made it possible for me to be here. I'm very excited and so, so thankful to be able to address all of you. You know, on my way here on the plane, I was typing out a whole list, a kind of litany of reasons why I'm honored to speak before you all. And then I got here and I heard uh, Dr. Butchevsky um, speak and I was a little annoyed because he took my list. <laughs> I was going to talk all about how you were proclaiming with your lives the Christian witness against a hostile culture. And uh, I was going to use one word that he didn't use. I was going to use the word prophetic. But other than that, he took it all. So there's... <laughs> So there's, there's nothing more that, that I can add except, except my own experience of, of, of joy, which although I can describe it, it's, it's incommunicable. I, there, you know, and so I'm just uh, deeply th thankful and also thankful to have uh, enjoyed not only uh, Dr. Butchevsky's uh, talk last night, but the wonderful day of talks uh, today, uh, learning something very important from each speaker. And I have to say, it's a little daunting sp speaking after such wonderful speakers, and especially after dinner, too, when people get a little sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to keep you interested. And there usually is a bit of um, suspense in my talks, because <laughs> unlike the other speakers, although I do have some some notes to keep me generally on on track. I I, I tend to uh, I, I think the musicians here, such as Daniel Matson, will know you know the expression. I, I tend to riff a bit, <laughs> and you know when you riff, there's always the danger that you might just go off key. <laughs> so I ask you all to please pray for Holy Spirit uh, guidance uh, for for me. Um, Try to pray under your breath, because I'll get a little nervous if, I, if, if as I'm speaking, I hear people go, people go, please, God, let her get back on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, among the things that I heard uh, today that really resonated uh, with me were Father Vogt's points about hope and about communion. When, Father uh, was speaking about uh, the scripture on where two are, or three are gathered in my name and how healing that is. And for me, that was where the saints came in to my own uh, experience of healing uh, because although I certainly have had people who, um, who supported me at different steps of my journey, and I'm also blessed to have a family which, although they may not quite understand me, uh, they, do, they do love me, thank, thankfully. Uh, but, but yet, um, there have been times in my life, and there are still, still times, when I, when I feel like you know, the kind of communion that I long for in you know, this world um, isn't you know, quite, you know, as I, as I wish it would be. There aren't people who, you know, quite understand me as I wish I were understood. Of course, that's why we pray that, that um, wonderful courage prayer about seeking to understand rather than being understood. But when I have that 
feeling of wanting to be understood, I think about the saints. And I, I go to the Eucharist and I say, Jesus, I know you're there. And I start talking to him and then I say, and St. Ignatius Loyola, I know you're there. <laughs> and I need, need you know, your, your help on such and such. I need your under, understanding. And this is the great gift of the saints that they uh, in, insert us into the family of God. Uh, John Paul II in Familiaris Consortio says something that is, uh, well actually, is it familiar as consortium? No, actually, I think it's his letter to families. In one of those documents, he says something that you don't normally see uh, when you see articles on uh, John Paul's Theology of the Body. Normally, the articles focus on what he teaches about husband, wife, children. And this is all very beautiful, vitally important for our culture. But what people don't mention is that John Paul speaks very directly to people who don't have what can be really called a family in the usual sense of the word. And he says these are people who are particularly close to the heart of Christ. And I, I, think, I think everyone should know this. Uh, you've heard today uh, from you know, a number of speakers about the crisis of family brokenness. And even people from intact families can still experience brokenness when something happens to rupture trust in the family, as happens with childhood sexual abuse, uh, the, the um, healing from which is the topic of my book, My Peace I Give You. So this is where the saints can help us because we are, through our baptism, in union with, with Christ, we are sons and daughters in the Son. And so, through our baptism with God as our Father, we have this other family that, that is in addition to our flesh and blood family. This is where we have the Gospel, uh, where Jesus says that whoever leaves father and mother for my sake and for the sake of the Gospel will receive fathers and mothers and sisters and, and brothers and houses. And then, of course, he has to say, with persecution. Ah! <laughs> but, 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 you know, with, with the persecution, it, it comes the blessing because it all configures us more closely to the, to the cross and configures us more, more closely to that union with Christ uh, through which we are in closer union with all the communion of saints and all the the mystical body. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to read you um, a short uh, observation just on, the, uh, on what was discussed in uh, Sister Marisha's talk and uh, by Father Emmerich and pretty much every speaker here about the crisis in our society and the need for, for hope. And this came to me today when I was thinking about what is your role, uh, those, those who are members of, of Courage, what is all of our roles as supporters of Courage and Encourage? How can we face the enormity of the, of the evil that is being promoted in our culture and contributes to um, the, uh, the uh, degrading of, of the institution of marriage and the uh, brokenness of the family? And the, what came to me was that the healing of the world begins with the church, and this means that it begins with you and me as Catholics living our baptism. And where does that begin with our living our baptism? Well, it begins with seeking God's healing for ourselves through prayer, the sacraments, and the life of the church, exactly as, as you're doing through, through practicing the courage principles. And it begins with seeking to remain always in God's will through living lives of virtue. And this is what made me think of a particular prayer that I wanted to share with you. It's 
uh, by Father Daniel A. Lord S.J., who uh, was born and raised uh, in Chicago before coming a, becoming a uh, St. Louis uh, Jesuit. Um, and this is his Thanksgiving on the Call of Christ. It's from a book of Thanksgivings that Father Lord wrote to pray after communion. And uh, he begins the Thanksgiving by thanking God for the opportunity to save the world from evil. And then he writes, Perhaps the thought of world conquest appalls and terrifies me, Lord Jesus. How can I, one small and unimportant individual, do anything significant to ensure the happiness of the human race? Yet even as I ask, I know the answer. I hear your consistent reply. Beyond all else, you ask me for the conquest of my own heart and soul, the small world within me, that is my field of battle and conquest. There I must plant your flag, which is the cross, and crown you as my conquering king. Even this small part, Lord Jesus, is a frightening assignment. I know the wild rebellion of my heart. I know how traitorous are my passions and how cowardly is my will. I feel within me the presence of spies and rebels. I remember how often I have surrendered my heart and soul to Satan, your relentless enemy. Yet you are already in my soul, Lord Jesus. You have come this morning in holy communion, which is your gentle conquest. The work is almost done, if only I will permit it and accept it. Take my heart and soul, king of the world, and make them a part of your kingdom forever. Uh, that's from Father Daniel A. Lord S.J.'s Thanksgiving on the Call of, of Christ. And so this is what I present as your task and my task when we when we see the enormity of the evil that's being promoted in the world, we are not to lose hope, not to lose faith, and we are to focus on winning this piece of turf that is our own soul and, and going forth to, to follow the call of, of Christ. So uh, with that in mind, uh, here's how the uh, next 40 minutes uh, are going to go. Um, I will tell you briefly about why I believe that my book, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, is needed. Uh, I'll tell you my own story focusing on what led me to seek healing through our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of saints. I'll speak about Mary and about healing of memory. Uh, and uh, I'll close with a few words on vocation, which is something that I've gathered is on many people's minds here, just from speaking to people here. If we have any time, uh, by the time that's over, I'd love to take your questions. Otherwise, I'll be delighted to meet you and answer any questions that you have downstairs in the book room. Uh, so, my piece I give you and why I believe it's needed. Well. When I first began giving talks, as you heard from Yvonne, it was to speak about my first book, The Thrill of the Chaste, which was the book that, that I wrote as uh, a new Christian. I was in RCIA when I wrote it because I, I first became, as you'll hear, I became Protestant at the age of 31. I was baptized and uh, church shopped for a while and thank God was was driven by the hound of heaven uh, into uh, the Catholic Church. And it was when I uh, started to uh, get serious about Catholic faith uh, in RCIA that I started to really get serious about living chastely. And I wrote The Thrill of the Chaste after living chastely for a relatively short time, only really um, a, a couple of years but having experienced enough of the struggle to know that for other people like me who had lived in the world, there was a need for a book on the struggle 
because at that time, the only books on chastity that I could find, other than Father Groeschel's The Courage to Be Chaste, uh, the only books I could find were books on teen purity, which you know, by the time I was you know, in my 30s was not exactly relevant to, to my life. You know, I'd open up one of these books that would say, of course you've been saving yourself for your prince, and I'd just be thinking to the author, sorry lady, that train has left the station. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so after The Thrill of the Chase came out in late 2006, I, I started to give talks on chastity. And what I found was that you know, contrary to popular belief where, you know, the, the temptation is just to generalize and say uh, that, oh, people who are living worldly lifestyles aren't interested in chastity, I found actually what you heard from Dr. Buczewski, I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, uh, what I heard was si similar to what um, that a professor uh, shared with you, which is that there are many people who are, in fact, very dissatisfied with living unchastely, uh, but they don't know how to get out of that behavior. And in speaking with them, I, I believed from what they were saying, kind of like what Dr. Uh, what Father Vogt was speaking about when he said that uh, you can tell if you're an, an alcoholic, if you're speaking to another alcoholic or a child of an alcoholic, I could tell in hearing these stories uh, from people who were struggling, that they had very likely experienced in childhood abuse or neglect or uh, the um, or, or uh, the the loss of a parent, perhaps through through divorce or or a combination of these things. And although I do discuss the effects of divorce in the Thrill of the Chaste, I really avoid in that book talking about abuse because I was not ready at that point to deal with the wounds of my own past, so I ignored it. And so I realized that if I really wanted to help people, that I had to start giving the full story, and that the full story would have to include healing from abuse, that it's when we heal these foundational wounds that we can begin to truly act from our wellness from our health and stop acting from our pathology. And I also wanted to write my piece I give you because even as uh, a new Catholic with all the helps of the church, uh, this, the sacraments, uh, reading the lives of, this, of the saints, I still um, had a very hard time finding my own brokenness in the mystical body. Uh, I was carrying the misplaced guilt that is so common to uh, abuse of uh, victims. Uh, and so I felt, and I can you know, now say with all certainty wrongly, that, but I felt that I had been stained by my abuse and that this made me somehow different from all these perfect Catholics who had perfect lives and loving families and never suffered any of these things. By the way, since writing my piece I give you and speaking about it, it's a great cure for thinking that everyone else has perfect lives. <laughs> it's, it's like waking up one moment, one morning, you know, having gone to sleep in Norman Rockwell land and you wake up and you're in Rwanda where everybody has suffered some kind of violation. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's terrible, but at the same time, it's, it's very interesting because it is like a kind of great secret where um, you realize that if this were not such a secret, we would really be, um, be winning the world for Christ uh, right now. Um, have any of you read G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday? It's good, I see a few hands. Well, well that book was instrumental in my, in my conversion, as I'll share. Um, and one of the, one of the th things in it, and I, I will try not to spoil it too much for you, but it's 
about a London policeman. Uh, it was written in the early 1900s when uh, there were bomb-throwing anarchists um, in, in London. And so this uh, policeman infiltrates a group of anarchists. And as he does, he starts to find out that these other anarchists are actually other undercover policemen <laughs> like, like him. And so at one point, he says, he says you know, if, if, if I knew that there were so many of us who were actually you know, policemen, then we could have you know, all ourselves just overthrown the leadership of this anarchist organization. A and it's really like that uh, with, the, with the brokenness, uh, the family brokenness. Yeah, I think that um, we have been, for various reasons, afraid to address this as a church. Uh, the abuse scandal has been just um, crippling on many, uh, on many levels. Uh, and uh, this was driven home to me when I heard, or I read Archbishop Dolan's, then Archbishop, I think, um, comments um, on the Sandusky uh, trial. Uh, Jerry Sandusky, the, the uh, uh, person employed, in the employ of the uh, football team in Pennsylvania, who um, who it, it came out was this terrible, terrible abuser, and uh, when uh, Cardinal Dolan was asked to uh, for comment, he said, "Well, it's hard for us in the church to speak about this because we've had our own problems." And I read that, and I wanted to say to him, on the one hand. Thank you for saying what you honestly feel. Thank you for trying to be sensitive as best you know how, and that is an attempt at a sensitive answer. But I also wanted to say to, to him, if we don't speak about this, who will? <laughs> we are, the healing has to begin with us. Uh, so this requires not, not only getting our own house in order, but also getting over our fear of mentioning abuse and our fear of being witnesses to the, uh, to the world um, on this, on this uh, issue. Um, because uh, only the light of, of Christ, uh, the, the light of, of, of the Holy Church of God that subsists in the Catholic Church, only that light can cast out uh, the darkness uh, in our society. Uh, and uh, there, this, uh, this specter of abuse, as you may have heard uh, with the Sandusky um, scandal, some, the statistics that were brought out show that one in four adult women and one in six uh, adult men uh, report having suffered childhood sexual abuse. Um, but I believe that the actual numbers are really much higher because those numbers only, refer, first of all, they're only what's reported. Uh, and people very often won't report what happened to them because they, even as adults, may not have written it as abuse because of the misplaced guilt. Uh, but secondly, um, what's, what's reported in those statistics is just what's known as the contact sexual abuse. There is also non-contact sexual abuse, and this is not just a term made up by, uh, by Christian therapists. This is a term that I, that I got off the uh, United Kingdom National Health website, where they say non-contact childhood sexual abuse includes, it includes a child being exposed to pornography, being intentionally exposed to adult nudity, to graphic sex talk. And any one of these things can have, uh, can have lasting uh, traumatic effects. Uh, when I was hearing Dr. I believe it was Dr. Buczewski, someone can c correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, um, but I, I believe he was saying that he and his family did not suffer from childhood sexual abuse, but he was exposed to pornography a lot growing up. 
And you know, the, the, you know, it's not nice for another speaker at a conference to heckle, but I, but I wanted to shout, that is abuse, that is childhood sexual abuse. You've had a traumatic incident and in your child, childhood life, and, and it's important to be aware of that because it's when we're aware of the traumas that we have suffered that we can begin to correct the wrong ideas about ourselves, the lies about ourselves that these traumas have caused us to absorb, or, or may have caused us to absorb. And it's, th it's then that we can begin to address um, any lasting effects. Now, not everyone who has suffered trauma will experience PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Only a minority of people who have experienced a traumatic uh, event will experience that, but most people who have experienced traumatic stress will experience at least one symptom of traumatic uh, stress. And so for me, as a, as a Catholic, experiencing these, these symptoms and wanting to place my own suffering in the mystical body, what really helped me, and I have to say Father Vogt's website with his stories of saints was instrumental in this, was learning that there are saints who have suffered childhood sexual abuse, and uh, learning their, their stories, and, and seeing not only that they had suffered what I had suffered, which helped me to overcome the misplaced guilt, but also seeing how they found healing, and in particular, how they found healing through uniting their own wounds with the wounds of, of the wounded, crucified, and resurrected Christ. Uh, so so he, my own witness, in terms of witnessing both to the evil that I've suffered and the good that God has brought out of that evil, um, my witness begins with the fact that uh, my parents split when I was very uh, young. I was born into a, into a Jewish family uh, just outside of New York City. Uh, my parents split when I was five, and my sister and I were raised by our mother. Uh, and it was during that time when my father was no longer present to protect me that the abuse began. My first abuse occurred when I was molested by an adult man outside the home. Uh, when I told my mother about it, she said, you let him do that to you. I was five years old. Uh, later on, the abuse took place at home. On a few occasions that I can remember, I was molested by one of my mother's boyfriends uh, in my mother's presence. Uh, but more than that, throughout my childhood, my mother's home was what I would call a sexually porous environment. I don't recall clear boundaries. My personal modesty was neither respected nor protected. I was not shielded from adults' nudity, substance abuse, and sex talk. Uh, and more than that, my mother didn't recognize the most fundamental boundaries between her identity and my own. Uh, as a result, from early childhood, I became psychologically enmeshed with my mother in a manner that I now know was profoundly unhealthy. Um, but this enmeshing uh, continued through adulthood. I was still enmeshed at the time that I wrote the thrill of the chaste, um, and it was painful and uncomfortable. I knew there was something wrong with it. You know, I used to have these terrible, un irrational fears, thinking, oh my gosh, what if anything bad ever happens to my mother? I would just die. I wouldn't even, you know, and, and just living in fear that anything should happen to my mother, needing to talk to her, you know, every day to, to, um, to get her reinforcement for for me and 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 you know to know that she was okay and you know th that sort of thing I've since learned reading up a bit about effects of post traumatic stress that 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 is related to the kind of Stockholm syndrome that some uh, victims of uh, of uh, childhood sexual abuse uh, experience. Um, 
and, and this is something that can be hard for people to under to understand. You know, you know, for example, you know, if if a parent or a guardian, you know, abuse the child, why does the child develop such an attachment to to this person? Um, and what I've read with regard to the kind of Stockholm syndrome, you know, that's the syndrome where um, victims of kidnappers become attached to their kidnappers. The way the human brain works, it goes into survival mode. And for the child, uh, the child is completely dependent upon adults to survive. So if the child's guardian is abusive, the child may think, um, may, may, may think this is, you know, this is really terrible. I'm not, you know, I'm not happy about what's happening. But if this person who is my protector is so abusive, imagine what would happen if I didn't have this protector. Therefore, I have to stay close to this protector. And, uh, you know, that's, it's part of the way that the brain tries to get a person through life. And, you know, it can succeed in enabling you to survive rather than rather than, you know, as a young child run away from, from home. Um, but, you know, in the long run, it can lead to unhealthy, um, uh, to unhealthy attitudes. Um, so, uh, for, for me, um, my, my experience of abuse led me to really internalize lies about myself, lies uh, about uh, my identity. Um, although I had some Jewish uh, upbringing, very liberal Jewish uh, upbringing, um, I, I really didn't f feel that I had identity as uh, as a child of uh, of God. Um, what I learned from very early on, I say learned in in quotes because of course it's not something true, but I absorbed the lies of abuse, which were the lies that said that I was not valuable for who I was made in the image of God. Rather, I was valuable for what I did for others. And uh, so ultimately, all my relationships became modeled on this, both with men and with, and with women. Uh, although I never uh, had same-sex attractions, um, or I should say um, not um, not strong same-sex same, same sex attractions. Um, I, um, I did uh, take on this transactional view with men and, and women in any kind of friendship, any kind of relationship, where I thought, um, what can I get from this person and what can I give to this person so that this person will give me what I want to get? Uh, because I couldn't imagine that just being myself, being the person I was created to be, would attract people to me, make them want to be friends with me, or make a man uh, want to love me and 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 hopefully marry me, because I did want to get married. Um, I, I didn't think that there was something um, inherently beautiful in me that people would notice. I just thought it was about what do I what do I pr project. Um, you know, that, that old joke about how, you know, the most important thing is sincerity. If you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. <laughs> well, it was kind of, it was kind of like that. I grew, I grew up trying to fake sin sincerity. Um, and so uh, with that uh, pathology, um, by the time I was uh, in college, I was suffering from what I now realize is was, was dissociation, which is a common effect of post-traumatic stress. Now, when I say these things, please know that you, know, you can't generalize about every single person. Everyone's experience is, is different. Um, but uh, one uh, of the more common effects is creating a false self. Uh, in my case, inside, I felt like a vulnerable, unprotected child. Uh, I felt that um, that men were going to use me, and so I I um, wanted very much to be affirmed. I wanted to be loved, uh, but I thought if men were going to use me, then I had to get in control so that I could at least control how they used me. And so my idea of control was to build up this false self that was very sexually 
provocative. And I would push myself. I would get, I would push myself to do edgy and exhibit, to be an exhibitionist and to do things that even I felt kind of uncomfortable with, but I felt that this was ultimately empowering uh, because by acting very hyper sexual, then I could, you know, guarantee that I would receive, you know, a certain amount of uh, in attention in a certain, uh, in a certain way. Um, but I, unfortunately, and, and this is something that I, I talk about in, in my piece I give you, that kind of very hypersexualized, sexually aggressive uh, behavior is what attracts predators. They can sniff that out when someone is dissociating, when someone is, is putting on a, a false front. And so that just feeds into the trauma and can cause the, the victim to just keep repeating the, uh, the, the trauma. Uh, and that was what my life uh, was like uh, through my late teens, through my 20s, wanting love and uh, seeking love and, aff and affirmation through putting myself out there uh, sexually. And uh, not everyone that I attracted was a bad person, but certainly I was just saying, hey, here I am, use me. And you know, even someone who might under, under, under other circumstances be a very kind and, and loving person can be, can be tempted you know, by that and can j say, okay, you wanna be related to just on this genital you know, level? Fine, I'll relate to you that way. Um, and th so through this experience of seeking love and really setting myself up to only get what was not love, uh, I became very lonely and I also suffered from cyclical suicidal depression, which I now I know uh, to be the result of undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, what, one thing that I talk about in my piece I give you is the importance of finding a therapist who affirms you in chastity. Um, because during this whole time of my life, I was seeing a therapist in New York City who was uh, internationally renowned uh, for his work with uh, suicidal people. And he was totally follow your bliss. Uh, and you know, with the idea of bliss not being beatific vision, but really just being pleasure. Yes. And so, and so he was just pushing me very hard into the same lifestyle that was causing me to reenact the, the trauma and not diagnosing you know, the, the real cause of this behavior, you know, he, was, he would just write whatever was the, you know, DSM number that the insurance would pay out for, for a major depression and call it a day. Um, so it wasn't until much later when I found a qualified Catholic therapist, qualified is very important, check people's creden credentials, not everyone is qualified, uh, but it was only much later that I found that it was actually PTSD that was causing me to be suicidal. So what broke me out of that? Well, the grace of God reaching me in the most unexpected way. And it was when I was doing an interview with a rock musician. I was a rock journalist at, at this time. So you know, obviously, if God was going to reach me, he had to work pretty hard to find a, a rock musician who was willing to talk to me about something godly. Uh, this was not a musician in a Christian band. He was in a band called The Sugar Plastic, a power pop band from LA. But I just uh, thought I'd ask him a bright question because I was always looking to be affirmed. And so I wanted to show how, him how smart I was. So I asked him, uh, what are you reading these days? And he said, I'm reading The Man Who Was Thursday by G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> And so I went out and picked up this book, thinking that I was just going to, you know, read something like, you know, Jeeves and Wooster. I didn't know who G.K. Chesterton was. I thought it was like P.G. P. Woodhouse. And instead, reading this book by this great con Anglican convert to the to Catholic faith, that gave me a vision of Christianity like none that I'd seen before, uh, and who and who wrote about. Um, about the dictatorship of relativism as though he were writing today, only he, were he was writing a hundred years ago. And having had some very relativistic professors at NYU and being put off by them just from what little 
um, Jewish heritage I had, you know, I, I wanted to believe that there was really truth out there somewhere, uh, and I didn't like it when I had professors who said truth is what you make it. So there was something in, in Chesterton's defense of truth that spoke uh, to, to me. Uh, and uh, so I uh, d delved into all the Chesterton that I could, but still continuing to, to live my, uh, my unchaste life. And it was um, four more years after, after that, uh, at the age of 31, when I, uh, when at the age of 31, I finally started reading what had influenced Chesterton. I started reading the, the Psalms and the Gospels, and I had tried reading them before, but they had never really spoken to me. They had just been like flat, you know, black and white words on a page written by some person 2,000 years ago, uh, but not having any message for me personally. Uh, but one day um, in October of 1999, I felt moved in my heart to open up my little Gideon's New Testament um, to um, Romans 5.1, and I read, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, that's, that's the, that was the Hollywood moment when everything went from black and white into technicolor, and the words became three-dimensional and leapt off the page, and it was no longer just something some dead person wrote, but it was the voice of a person who, wanted to, who loved me and wanted to be in communion with me. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I get goosebumps just remembering it now. I, you know, at that moment, felt... Uh, the baptism of desire of the, the Holy Spirit. And you know, the baptism of desire, if it's a real baptism of desire, always leads us to, the, to water baptism. Um, it didn't lead me to, to quite the best place for water baptism. I, I walked into the nearest church I could find, which happened to be an Adventist church. But somehow, um, I. I was so determined not to be a joiner that I said to the, to, to the pastor, you know, I'm not so sure about this Ellen G. White stuff. You know, I don't, not, don't know if I want to accept all these Adventist che teachings. Can you just give me a generic baptism? Just wow. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> so God knew what he was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, God, uh, God knew, though. Um, and that's what started my, uh, my church uh, shopping. And uh, I have so much more that I want to, um, to share with you, uh, including how I got, uh, got into the Catholic Church. Um, but um, because I have, do I have about 15 more minutes, or how much time? About, about 15 or 20. 20 more minutes, okay. If I can go 20, then I can tell you that I can tell you how I got into the, into the Catholic Church. Um, it was after being Protestant for five years, I was working for the New York Post as a headline writer. Um, I, I was, dare I say it, an award-winning New York Post headline writer. Would you like to hear the headline that won me the New York State Associated Press Award first prize? It was, thank you, um, it was, <laughs> you're a good audience, I like you. Um, it was for a story about a court employee in Brooklyn who was suing the city because when he was taking a bathroom break at the courthouse, the toilet bowl fell under him and he was mildly injured. Now, now the mild injury is very important because you can't write a funny headline if somebody's seriously hurt. Uh, but since it was a mild injury, I was able to write hurt in line of duty. <laughs> Thanks, I'll be here all week. No, uh, yes, I, uh, <laughs> so, so I was, I was doing well in my you know, cushy job at New York Post, having gotten out of rock journalism and feeling like I was in a much you know, more, you know, more you know, morally acceptable place working for Rupert Murdoch. You know, little, did I, little did I know. Uh, and then one day I got handed this news story 
about women having so-called miracle babies through in vitro fertilization. And the whole story was about how wonderful this IVF was. And it said, you know, and this one woman had two embryos in had three embryos implanted and two took, and now she has miracle babies. And I thought, okay, so one embryo died, are we gonna put that in two? Because even though every human life is, is a gift from God, IVF is not a godly way for people to come into the world. That's why the uh, church speaks against it, because it instrumentalizes human life. And although I wasn't yet, uh, planning to become a Catholic, I'd read enough Catholic blogs <laughs> to, to know that there was something deeply wrong with this. Uh, so I, I took it upon myself to correct this story, <laughs> which you, you don't do when you're a copy editor. You just don't do. Uh, there are people above you who decide to make editorial changes. You know, you're only, you're, you're only able to say, you know, is duty spelled with two Ds or, or, one, or, or one or, 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 or three or, you know, something like that. Um, but I was just so angry reading this story that I just changed it. So where it said, you know, two embryos took, I added one died, I added a little explanatory note about how in the process of in vitro fertilization embryos are routinely destroyed. Well, you know, that there were, you know, just, just little, little things. And <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, uh, well, the, well the, praise, the praise goes to God who permitted, who permitted me to do an evil in order to bring good out of it, because it, it's really not right to try to do things under the radar at, 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 uh, at your job. What I should have done was just to have gone to the editor and to have said, I can't copy out of this story. This story is demeaning to human life and human dignity. And then when the editor picked her job off the floor, it would be just out. But, but instead, I tried to get the changes under the radar, got caught, and got, and got kicked out. Although there, there, was a, there, there was a memorable moment as I, as I was leaving, and my, cop, my direct boss, who didn't want me to be fired, the copy chief, was carrying my proverbial box for me. You know, you have to stuff all your things into a box and get out. And I shouted to the deputy copy chief the headline for the next Sunday's paper because I knew that the next uh, Saturday was Donald Trump's wedding and that they were gonna have a picture of the bride on the front page for Sunday. So I shouted, Milt, for Sunday, lady is a Trump. <laughs> And, and wouldn't you know, not only did they use that, not, not, not paying me for it, but, they, uh, al but also if you go to the museum in Washington, D.C., where I now live and study theology, they have this book of the New York Post's greatest headlines, and that's on the cover of the book. <laughs> Thank you. Well, just before I was fired and when I knew the ax was going to fall, I, I was feeling very desperate because I thought I have failed everybody. I've failed God because I knew as, as a good Protestant that it says right there in, uh, in Ephesians uh, 6, serve your employer as you would serve the Lord. Um, I felt that I had that I'd failed the pro-life movement by being uh, you know, a public pro-life saboteur, so that makes the pro-life movement looked bad. And so having felt like I failed everybody, I just felt like, oh gosh, I really could use a friend in heaven right now. And like a good Protestant, I thought, Jesus is my friend in heaven. And I thought, yeah, I know, but I really need another <laughs> friend in heaven right now. <laughs> and, and so um, I, I went you know, online, and they have this, this site. It, it's kind of like a, 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 a Catholic match for finding your right s saint. <laughs> it, it's, it's called the Patron Saint Index. And you just look up you know, whatever your thing is that you need a saint for. And you find it. And so I found St. Maximilian Kolbe, patron saint of journalists and pro-lifers. And I was very afraid of, of asking a saint's prayers, because as a Protestant, you believe it's idolatry, you can go to hell for this. But I thought, well, if he's the patron saint of journalists and pro-lifers, then I get like two for one. I just have to pray to this one saint and have it done with, and then I never have to pray you know, to another, an another saint again. And you know, of course, God is going, ha, 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 I know what's going to happen. But <laughs> I, I didn't know. So I, I started reading St. Maximilian Kolbe's story on online. And uh, you know, he, 
I guess, you know, we're, we're right next to Marytown. You know, it's, it's also, you know, God's sense of humor. You know, God knew that years later I would be speaking at the Courage Conference next door to Marytown, which is so beautiful. Um, Anyway, so I was reading about St. Maximilian Kolbe, Franciscan friar, um, uh, sent to Auschwitz by the Nazis uh, after the invasion of uh, Poland. And uh, I, I get to, to the part where he, where he volunteers to die in place of a Polish soldier with a wife and family who was condemned to death in a starvation cell. And, uh, and then I get to the very end where it says that this soldier whose life St. Maximilian saved was, the, uh, was, was present when St. Maximilian was canonized by John Paul II more than 30 years later. And I just broke down crying then and there. And I just started talking to St. Maximilian, just you know, exactly like my Catholic friends had been trying to get me to do. You know, They would say, just speak to a saint like you'd speak to a friend. And I'd be like, yeah, well, my friends aren't dead. You know, That's the, the Protestant answer. Um, not realizing, of course, that those in heaven are alive in Christ. And, and so, so I started uh, s sitting there in my cubicle at, at work, waiting to get fired from the New York Post. I, I said to St. Maximilian, dear St. Maximilian, I'm in trouble. I'm about to get fired. Please pray for me. And at that moment, I just felt this whoosh, this rush of grace come down from heaven. And it was not at all what I was expecting. Because from hearing Catholics talk about saints, I just thought that Catholics thought that saints were like this favor bank in the sky. You know, you, you pray, yeah, you, you pray for like material things that you, that you want or for a healing. But, you know, I just thought of, you, you know, you hear things like people say, Saint Anne, today's Saint Anne, Saint Anne, Saint Anne, send me a man, or, you know, Tony, Tony, something's lost. Or, or, or does Tony, Tony come around, something's Look lost? Around. Look around, that's it, for Saint Anthony. Um, so I thought that asking a saint's prayers would, would lead to my, um, you know, having this, you know, wonder, wonderful, you know, mo moment like you see in the movies where suddenly the editor-in-chief, you know, come, walks out of his office and says, you know, we're not going to fire you. And what's more, you're getting a promotion. <laughs> what I was not expecting was grace. And I was not expecting to have this sense of peace. You know, the, the, what the the verse that had that had really uh, converted me reading in the Bible was was therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that was the peace that I was chasing when I got baptized. And then I felt the same peace asking St. Maximilian's intercession, where I just felt like suddenly I was at this eye in the middle of the storm, and I knew that no matter what happened to me, I was going to be okay, because just in asking his intercession, I was aligned with God's will in a way I hadn't been before. It was like, you know, the GPS where, where you look and you're like, you know, th that needle point that's way off the map. So it's like, you know, asking St. Maximilian's intercession, like, you know, God's hand picking up this needle and going, boop, there you are, back on the map, back on the, back on the, way, to, the way to heaven. And uh, realizing that, it just opened up the communion of saints for me, because I realized what I would later read in Francis de Sales, that, that while it's true what Protestants say, that God doesn't need the saints to answer our prayers, St. Francis de Sales says that God, God wants to, to uh, enable the saints to intercede for us, because he wants us to, to be in union with one another uh, in in heaven and on earth and with those who you know are being pu purified uh, we, we say we say un uh, under the earth those who are waiting to to get into heaven who are in purgatory and, and so I you know chased that peace into the Catholic uh, Church um, and as I mentioned to you even as a as a Catholic I still um, was feeling the effects of the childhood abuse and wanting to find healing in Christ uh, and having trouble finding reading material or other material that really, um, that, that really uh, spoke to me in the way I needed to be spoken to. And 
Uh, a big problem for me was something that is, um, that I encountered that is unfortunately popular in, in some uh, circles of the Catholic Church, which is this idea that if you want to be healed of traumatic memories, you have to offer every single memory to, to Jesus and put, like, and replay each memory, re, kind of reenact it and bring Jesus into it. I had a Catholic therapist who said, well, I can't really help you unless you're willing to go over each memory with me. Um, I later learned that, that this is something that that therapist wasn't qualified to do. It's called exposure therapy, and it has to be done only by someone who's qualified. But there's this um, movement that, you know, that is trying to um, bring this in as something that can just be done by the ordinary layman. Um, and, and because I was uh, afraid to do that, I was feeling like, gosh, I couldn't be... I couldn't be healed. Um, you know, I now realize that my, my concerns about that were very legitimate uh, because, um, first of all, if my memories of trauma were enmeshed with one another, I was living in a sexually porous environment for almost my entire young life since age, age uh, five, since my parents split up. So I had reason to fear that calling up one memory would be enmeshed with another memory and it would never end. Uh, and, sec and second of all, I really wasn't sure that I could remember each memory. So it was, it was terribly depressing to, to think, you know, gosh, you know, could it be that I will never find healing from certain memories just because I can't relive them? And that's a common that's a common thing to happen for, you know, for people who have suffered trauma, not to be able to remember what happened. Uh, so the healing that I received um, that really was the answer to these questions that I had, that, that um, where God made himself present to me in a new way. Um, it happened when I was on an Ignatian uh, retreat. Uh, the, eight-day version of the spiritual exercises with Father Dennis Brown, OMV. And uh, at one point, I was praying before the Eucharist in the tabernacle, and this image came to me of the Eucharist as like being at the center of this kind of great uh, bicycle wheel kind of shape with where it was radiating uh, these rays like spokes that went out to the entire world taking up everyone and everything in its embrace and bringing everyone and everything back to the Eucharist. And I meditated upon that and asked God, what did he want to show me through that? And what I realized was that, was that the Jesus that we receive in the Eucharist is the wounded, crucified, resurrected Jesus. And St. Thomas Aquinas says that the reason why the events of the passion of Jesus can still heal us, even though Jesus is no longer um, on the cross uh, suffering, is because um, Jesus is, um, as Aquinas puts it, Christus Passus, the Christ who suffered. Um, and so he, 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 while he has always had the will to suffer for us from before the beginning of time, um, he, he now has actually suffered and is in some sense the product of his suffering. He bears within him the memory of his suffering. He still has his wounds now glorified. And so I, I realized how freeing that was because, you know, what is the past, really? Um, the past only has meaning in so much as it remains in us, in so much as that we are in some way the product of, of our past experiences. I wouldn't be the same Dawn if I hadn't suffered the evils that I've suffered, as, as we heard uh, Father Vogt speak so beautifully uh, about that same topic earlier today. Uh, so, so I uh, realized that if I unite my own wounded heart with the wounded and resurrected and glorified heart of Jesus, then my wounds become the cracks that his light can get in. And, and so uh, his, um, 
his light can actually bleed back into my past, so to speak. Because as long as Jesus' grace is making contact with me as I am now, if I am really present for Christ now as he is really present for me in the Eucharist, then any part of my past that remains with me is touched by his grace. That was, praise God, yes, that's tremendously freeing. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that we can't be helped by what, when, when painful memories come up, it doesn't mean we can't be helped by offering those memories to Christ, but it also means that we are not in any way to feel ourselves bound or constrained by being unable to remember things because God's grace is, is greater uh, than, than that. Um, because we're, we're running out of, out of time, um, I, just, um, I, I just want to uh, speak um, a, a bit about... Um, about memory, I was going to speak about Mary and memory. Um, for that, uh, because of time, I'll, I'll refer you to chapter two of my piece I give you, where I speak about Mary as a model for purification of memory. Um, but um, but I'll, I'll leave you first just with a short observation about memory and then a short observation about vocation. Um, with regard to memory, in my piece I give you, I tell how I used to think that the only way I could heal from the pain of my past was by simply blocking out memories of the past. Uh, but I found that if I tried to block out the past completely, it would come back in painful ways through flashbacks or nightmares or feelings of anxiety that I couldn't trace. And what I've learned over time and what I share in my piece I give you and what I want to share with you now is that Memory is not the enemy. Uh, the key to healing is not to forget your past, but to find moments in your past when someone did something kind for you, when someone protected you, when someone smiled at you, when someone performed an act of love for you without expecting anything in return. And if you can't even find a moment in your in, in the times when you were wounded in your past, if you can't even find a moment when another human being showed you kindness or love, find a moment where you could have lost your life, but you didn't. And when you remember that, just know that it was no accident that your life was saved. Your being alive today is no accident. God loves you and God has sustained you all your life, even in the midst of evil, because he wanted to bring you to this beautiful new day. And just a, a short word of encouragement to, to those of you who are discerning voc vocation. As I've told you, for many years of my life, I, I wanted uh, to, to be married, and I thought that was where my happiness lay. Well, it's an interesting thing about, about God that he... Um, he, he meets us where we are, but the, the more that we, that we try with a, sincere, with, a, with a true heart to follow him, the more he leads us into being open to new kinds of happiness uh, that we couldn't imagine before. In my case, over the past few years studying theology, getting my MA and then most recently my, uh, my STB degree from Dominican House of Studies, and thinking about how much I wanted to be a theology professor one day, um, I started to think, well, gosh, you know, I, I shouldn't really be out looking for someone to marry if I want to be a theology professor, because if I want to serve the church, I have to be really open to wherever I might get a job teaching, wherever I might be sent, and it wouldn't be fair to a husband to say, well, I can marry you, but only if I can then get the job at the place where I want to get a job and you'll move with me and so on. So I started to stop looking because I started to feel vocational about, about, my, um, te about my teaching. Um, but then uh, I, I thought, you know, well, you know, it seems like if I'm not going to seek marriage that I should seek some form of consecration. Uh, I don't qualify for consecrated virgin, but, you know, perhaps there's some other form of consecration. Um, any bishop can take, you know, any layperson, whether they're a virgin or not, under, under private vows of obedience, of, of chastity. Um, and when, when this first started entering my, my head, I, I thought, um, 
I thought, well, you know, if God didn't preserve uh, me so that I didn't, um, if God didn't pres preserve me so that I still had my virginity, um, then, you know, God must not really want me to a consecrated type of vocation. Um, and um, and I, I knew that I wasn't called to a vocation in the convent. I knew I was called to something in the world. And normally the only thing that, that the only option that one has if one is looking for something diocesan in the world is consecrated virgin. Um, but then I, I started to um, think about it more and to research vocation. And um, what, what came to me in prayer, um, and also through a, a dream that I had, um, a dream where uh, Father Ed Dowling, actually, whom you heard about from Father Vogt, um, appeared to me in this dream. And he, um, he, had, he was at a table, like a, an altar, and, and there was a book on it, like an altar missile. And he pointed to something in it, and he said, and he said, it's time for you to study the chapter on the mystery of spiritual motherhood. And I woke up and, um, and I thought, you know, what is the mystery of spiritual motherhood? Uh, I've heard, I know what spiritual motherhood is, what's the mystery? And I looked it up, I found Mariarlis Cultus, Paul VI, speaking about, um, about how all mysteries relate to Mary. And, and with, with this dream and with the research that I did, finding that a bishop can place anyone he wants, you know, an, not place, but can, 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 um, can okay anyone he, anyone he wants to, to be um, vowed or consecrated in the world. Um, I realized that perhaps it's not a question of God preserving me in perfect you know, chastity, you know, and, until calling me to, to a vocation. Perhaps that's not the only way God works. Uh, as you heard earlier with, with Father Vogt and Felix Culpa, perhaps it's that creation is not God's greatest miracle. Perhaps God's greatest miracle is recreation. Like St. Thomas Aquinas says, that as great as all creation is, God's forgiving a single sin is a greater miracle than all creation. Uh, so I am now uh, pursuing uh, this vocation. I have a spiritual director who is going to present me to, to my uh, diocesan bishop as someone who would like to be consecrated in the, in the world under obedience to him. I ask your prayers for that. And I want to encourage all of you to know that, per, that perhaps God, those of you who do feel called to a, voc to a celibate uh, vocation, that perhaps this is in fact what God has wanted to, to, all along for you and that this is how God intends to show his glory uh, through you and, and through your life. That, uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry to have taken up so much time, but I, I would love to meet, uh, I'm sorry I don't have time for questions and answers here, but I'd love to meet you uh, downstairs in the, in the book room. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you.